Today, America faces a problem. In the last 24 hours alone, 15 people waiting for kidney transplants have died. This problem happened yesterday, it's happening today, and it will happen tomorrow. This problem is not going away. And the issue that faces the United States and nearly the rest of the world is a simple lack of supply. At this very moment, there are about 100,000 patients on the kidney transplant waiting list. And over this next year, only about 20,000 of these people will receive these life-changing organs. This is where a system that allowed for compensation in return for transplants could step in. And while concerning to many at first, upon careful examination of a Christian moral philosophy of the body, it's clear that such a system is both morally acceptable and greatly beneficial. Such a system would both incentivize kidney transplants and do so morally. Now right now, it's illegal to sell your kidney around the world. In the United States in 1984, Congress passed the National Organ Transplantation Act, making it illegal to buy, sell, or otherwise financially compensate someone for their organs. More recently, the World Health Organization, or WHO, passed a similar uh, ban for their member nations. Both of these legislated bodies were concerned about the potential abuses that such a system might pose to lower socioeconomic classes, as well as the potential degradation to the human body. But upon re-evaluation of a compensation-based system, it's clear that such a system not only would protect the lower classes, but also wouldn't degrade the human body. However, before we start talking about kidneys with respect to payment, we first need to talk about transplantation. And more specifically, what is the moral foundation that it rests upon? To do this, we need to first look at what a kidney is. And to do that, we can look to Aristotle and his four causes to help us define a thing. Aristotle's four causes define four key aspects of a thing, and they are the material, the efficient, the formal, and final causes. The material cause is exactly what it sounds like. It defines the material, or stuff, that makes up an object. The efficient cause is who or what created an object, or brought it into being. The formal cause is the shape or way an object is formed, which allows it to function. And the final cause is the end, goal, or purpose <laughs> of an object. Now, with respect to human kidneys, the material cause is, simply put, human flesh. The efficient cause is one's parents. But the formal and final cause are a little bit harder to parse out because they're twofold. The kidney has formal and final causes, both in and of itself, and also with respect to its part in the whole human body. Within itself, the kidneys are meant to filter toxins out of the blood and produce urine. And it's formed in a way that it can, be, that it can do that. And it's supposed to do that in and of itself. But it's not just operating in a vacuum. The kidney is a part of the whole larger system of the human body. And the distinction to make here is key, because without this respect of the kidney's part in the whole human body, we would be ignoring the kidney's primary end. Without functioning in the human body, the kidney has no innate worth. It's analogous to a bike pedal without a bike. Without its ability to function towards its end, it's useless. However, we also need to look at what the Bible tells us about our bodies and what they are and what they're meant for. And while the Bible doesn't explicitly come out and say what we can and cannot do with our kidneys, in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about the body to help describe the proper functioning of the church body. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Here Paul reinforces the idea that the parts of the body are for, for the body, and the body cannot function without them, and the parts cannot function without the body. And this clearly applies to kidneys as a part of the body. But this, but why is this important? What, what importance does it, the Aristotelian causes and biblical causes help us determine whether or not transplantation is moral? 
It helps us because this right view of what kidneys are and are for is a foundation for the Thomistic principle of totality. Now, Thomas Aquinas was an extremely influential church father, and his principle of totality states that there is an inherent good in life and in the proper functioning of the complete human body. And in light of the Aristotelian causes, this makes sense. There is an inherent good in each individual part of the body functioning towards its end, towards its telos, and for the functioning and flourishing of the whole human body. However, an original interpretation of the principle of totality only accounts for half of the picture of transplantation. Because while it allows for sick and ailing kidneys to of course be removed from the body, because they fight against their own end, their own telos, as well against the functioning and flourishing of the body, it doesn't allow for healthy kidneys to be removed from healthy patients. It doesn't allow this because such a removal would be unnecessary and would unnecessarily mar the good completeness of the functioning human body. While seemingly at a philosophical impasse here, philosopher and theologian Mark J. Cherry proposes that we take a closer look at the principle of totality. Cherry offers that while the original principle of totality stated that the good was in the complete function, the function of the complete anatomical body. Cherry offers that the good is maintained in the adequate functioning of the body. The good is in the functioning of the body, not in the presence of every unnecessary part. We wouldn't say that the good in the human body is diminished in any way in someone who's had their appendix removed, or someone who's donated or sold blood. And similarly, due to the dual natures of, kidney, of kidneys and their ability to function properly on their own, we can see that kidneys as well can be morally removed from the healthy patient and given to patients in pain. Therefore, taking our Aristotelian and biblical view on what kidneys are and are for, alongside the Thomistic principle of totality, we can see more clearly now the moral foundation the kidney transplantation rests upon. What kidneys are and are for is not changed or corrupted throughout the process of transplantation, and neither is the goodness inherent in the human body and in its function. Now we need to look at the implications of this moral foundation. And more importantly, not the moral foundation that kidney transplantation rests upon, but that which it doesn't. Note that the motives or altruistic nature of the transplant is not necessary at all to prove the goodness inherent in kidney transplants. The gift aspect of a kidney transplant isn't necessary to show that a kidney transplant is morally beneficial. Now, if altruism is not a necessary prerequisite for a kidney to be considered for a kidney transplant to be considered moral, does the addition of compensation or payment change that? We need to take a step back and look more broadly at what compensation does as a whole to gain a clearer view, to gain a clearer view. When we do this, we see that compensation is used to incentivize good action. What this means is that it doesn't change the action or the moral integrity of the action. For, to give an example, the procedure of kidney transplantation is the same. Whether the man on the table was given the kidney or whether he bought it. And likewise for the donor, whether compensated or not. Even if the motives of the individual are poor, it will not change the inherent good of either the action or the outcome. To give an example, if a rich man donated millions of dollars to charity, Simply to selfishly bring fame and attention to himself, he himself is considered arrogant and selfish. But we wouldn't view his donation as immoral. And the distinction to make here is separating the motives of the man from the morality of the action. Because while the personal motives of the individual here are corrupt and have personal and eternal ramifications for himself, they do not necessarily reflect on the institution of donation. We wouldn't ban all donations on the off chance that the individuals involved might have corrupt motives. And similarly, because compensation with respect to kidney transplants, because it doesn't inherently corrupt the motives of those involved, we should accept it as a morally viable way of incentivizing much needed kidney transplants. Therefore, we can see that compensation doesn't affect the morality of a kidney transplant before or after the procedure. And now all that's left to determine is whether such a system would work. But first, how would it work? Well, right now, when a patient needs a kidney, they register with a national nonprofit registry, 
are matched with the donor, and the transplant takes place. In a system that allowed for compensation, almost nothing would need to change. Both the donor and the recipient would be registered with the same national nonprofit registry. The two would be matched. They would meet and discuss fair compensation, and then the two would have the procedure and go their separate ways. One with a life-saving organ, and the other with fair compensation. Structurally, almost nothing would need to change. Compensation in this uh, system could take two primary forms. Governmentally provided compensation and privately provided compensation. And today I do not intend to lay out which system would be better or why, but simply to lay out the options. <coughs> Governmentally provided incentives, on the one hand, could take many forms, such as tax incentives, a simple cash incentive, or any other incentive <coughs> by which Congress deems fit. On the other end of the spectrum, private compensation would simply take a cash form. And it is important to note there would be need for governmental regulation over private incentives due, the, due to the potential of abusive monopolies. Because the donor is the only person matched with that recipient, they could theoretically charge outrageous abusive prices. And similar regulations instituted in other uh, situations where monopoly is a concern, those would be needed to be instituted in this situation as well. But, so a system based off of compensation for kidneys would be structurally fairly simple. But would it work? Would it actually solve the problems that the current purely altruistic system has left for society? Fortunately, there's a promising test case that offers hope. And while it isn't the shining example of much at all, Iran has for once got it all figured out. <laughs> In 1997, Iran instituted a compensation-based transplant system for kidneys, and within two years, had practically eradicated their kidney transplant waiting list. In Iran, the system functions similar to, similarly to how it would in the United States. They have a national nonprofit registry, which matches patients and oversees the system. Compensation for Iran takes both the governmental and private forms. The government pays for the procedure both for donor and the recipient, and also pays a thousand dollars Iranian equivalent to the donor, pays for health care for a year for the donor, and waives required military service for male citizens. On top of that, private compensation in Iran adds about $4,500 Iranian equivalent. And looking at Iran's track record, this compensation package is clearly sufficient for ending their kidney needs. In fact, in Iran, there's no longer a waiting list to sell your kidney. Excuse me, there's no longer a waiting list to get kidneys. There is a waiting list to sell your kidneys. But to really gauge the success of the Iranian system, you can compare its success with that of the United States. In Iran, getting from registry to operating table takes about two to three months. In the United States, just getting matched takes three to five months. Years. If the United States could even get close to scratching the surface of success that the Iranian system has found, thousands of lives would be saved. But let's go back to Congress's primary concerns. Those of potential abuses to lower socioeconomic classes. First is the idea that those in lower socioeconomic classes might be effectively forced into transplantation under this system. What this neglects is that this does not negatively impact those involved. It's an extremely safe procedure with few long-term risks that provides fair incentive. Not only that, but being in a poor financial state simply means less opportunity for turning down money-making avenues. For example, Bill Gates doesn't have to worry about running the graveyard shift to McDonald's simply because of his financial stability. In fact, to not allow those who need the money to sell their kidneys is unfair. Next is a concern that in a compensation-based system, kidneys would be basically <coughs> reserved for the upper classes as the only people of it, um, uh, that have the opportunity to purchase them. This simply isn't true. In the Iranian system, a survey of 1,000 patients revealed that while 84 donors were poor, 84 percent of donors were poor, over 50 percent of recipients were poor as well. This clearly demonstrates that kidneys are not just reserved for the upper classes, 
preying on the financial struggles of the lower classes. <coughs> Not only that, but the current institution of healthcare disadvantages lower class citizens in all aspects of healthcare, and a compensation based system doesn't further that disparity. Rich people will have more access to better care, and that would not be any worse in a compensation-based system than it already is in the current state of healthcare. Even with this in mind, the life-saving potential of a compensation-based system, both for the poor and those more privileged, is astronomical, <coughs> and the minor disadvantages already accepted in the rest of medicine pale in comparison. Third is a concern that a compensation-based system might lead to low regulatory standards, or even a black market. This misunderstands the closely overseen and regulated nature of kidney transplants. <coughs> this is a system that matches individuals to each other for transplantation. At no point is there any room for a third party to slip in and take the reins. If the fear is of a black market, then it must be considered that a black market currently exists solely because of the failings of the current altruistic system. If the current system worked perfectly, then there would be no demand for a black market. <coughs> Not only this, but black market kidneys are exceedingly expensive, ridiculously unreliable, and extremely unsafe. If a compensation-based system were put into play, it, would not, it, only, it not only wouldn't provide space for a black market, but it would actively undermine the demand for a black market. Because in a compensation-based system, people could get kidneys cheaper, much easier, and safer. Therefore, we can see that while concerns may reasonably arise, a compensation-based system is not like that which many in the past have feared. It bridges the gap between bringing in more kidneys <coughs> and doing so both morally and equitably. Therefore, we can see that not only is a compensation-based transplant system for kidneys morally viable, but also practically would, pro would uh, fill the gaping hole in America's ability to properly treat or ailing patients.